Hey everybody, welcome to Skype a Scientist Live. Um, today we're gonna be hearing again from uh, the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles County. Uh, we had a museum week with them a couple weeks ago at the end of April, because it's currently May. All the time is running together in my head. Um, and so uh, this is a nonprofit organization. We are completely, almost completely donor supported. So you can help us out by donating at paypal.me slash Skype a Scientist or patreon.com slash Skype a Scientist. We are also thinking about how to pursue uh, July and August. So if you um, like what has been happening, please let me know um, and we can uh, schedule stuff that you're interested in. You can tell us that on Twitter. You can tell us that in the Q&A today. Um, if there's a type of science that you'd like to see in July and August, please let me know. June is pretty much already scheduled. Um, later this week, today's Wednesday, on Friday, we're gonna be hearing from Stacey Phillips uh, all about mountains. She is super engaging and wonderful, and so that's happening at 1 p.m. Eastern, um, and so you should definitely be here for that. Next week, we're talking about bugs with Gwen Pearson. We're also talking about elephants and all about how they communicate and how they're actually pretty similar to us in a lot of ways. Um, so you can check that out at skypeascientist.com, click the live streams tab, and then um, you'll see everything that we have coming up. June is going to be packed. From the entire first four weeks of June, we have at least one event every single day. So it's going to be good. And the first three weeks of June, we're partnered up with um, a queer and STEM advocacy group called Noble Step, and we have uh, all of our scientists in the first three weeks are all part of the LGBTQIA plus community. So, um, but really they're just gonna be talking about their science. So uh, that's, we just wanna highlight a lot, lots of different ways to be a scientist and, and that's awesome. So uh, with that, I will stop talking and hand it over to Dean. Well, thanks so much, and, and thanks for coming here, and thanks to all of you who are, are, are listening. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dean Pencheff. I'm a research biologist. I work at the Natural History Museum of LA County, and um, I'm one of those people who had such a lack of imagination that when I decided I wanted to be a marine biologist as a kid, I never had a better idea, and that was it, and I just kept doing it. Um, I'm still doing it. Um, so I. Uh, I started by volunteering in a marine lab when I was in high school, ended up going to college, um, studying uh, biology there, um, went to graduate school um, in Berkeley, and there I studied biomechanics um, in you know, a marine environment. And biomechanics is the study of how physical factors interact with organisms. So I, I then went on to do a lot of work with fluid flow and how it interacts with barnacles and algae and crabs and how crabs find their prey by smell and things like that. Um, and after doing that, I uh, ended up at University of South Carolina, um, doing research there for a while. And um, then I fell in love. And because of that, I had to move to, to uh, Los Angeles. So I quit my job and uh, moved to Los Angeles and started looking for work, as one does. Um, and ended up uh, working at the Natural History Museum of LA County and shifted my job entirely and started working on what's basically the, the bioinformatics, the, the computer background to taxonomy and systematics, how we name species, which is a really different thing to do for a while. And that slowly morphed into working on, on biodiversity. So I really think of myself as a biodiversity scientist today. And I work in a research group of about six people. And the problem that we've taken on is that, as we all know, the environment is changing, the marine environment is changing, and we're really trying to struggle to manage how we deal with our coast. Where do we put parks? Where, how, where do we put preserves? How much fishing should we allow? How do we manage our interaction with the coastline? To do that, you have to know what's there. You have to know what organisms are there. And the way we do that in marine biology is horrible. Um, <laughs> we go out with boats, we drop nets off the side, we put grabs down, we put divers in the water, it's incredibly expensive, it's incredibly time consuming, and it doesn't get us great data. It gets us very sparse data. Um, for example, the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach here do a biological survey every five years, and it costs them several hundred thousand dollars every time. Um, the coast is changing too fast for that to work, basically. If you're gonna figure out how things are working, you need to be able to tell that quickly. 
So we've latched onto a technology called um, environmental DNA. And the way that works is that every organism has, as you all know, has DNA in it. And it's unique. It's unique to every species. It's unique to every one of us, actually. But basically, it's pretty similar within a species and very different between species. That gives you the clue that maybe if you can take a sample of DNA of an organism, you could tell the difference between species just by looking at the DNA. So you can do that. Turns out there's one or two or three genes that you can pick, little segments of the DNA, that can be used as diagnoses for species. So if you get that one gene from a human, it's definitely different from a chimpanzee. It's very different from a sea star. So you can build a library of those little sequences. And if you have that library, if you take a tissue sample of, a, of an unknown organism, check that DNA sequence and look it up in the library, you can tell what the species is. And that's really fast. You can do that in a matter of hours. The cool part is that you guys have all watched CSI and shows like that. We all shed DNA all the time into the environment. And so it turns out what you can do now is take a cup of seawater. Actually, I have a cup. It's not seawater, but that much water um, from the ocean. Collect all the DNA in that seawater, sequence the special genes in that seawater, and get a list of all the organisms that were in that area at that time. You can do that very quickly. You can do that very cheaply. So that's the technology that we've been developing for the past few years in this program called DISCO, the D Diversity Initiative for the Southern California Ocean. Um, the, the one little, little glitch that we have right now doing that is that, as I said, you have this database of sequences that you look up the DNA in. That database for marine organisms, for marine invertebrates, which is mostly what I work on, is horrible. Um, there's almost nothing in it. There are literally thousands of species. We think there are about three to 5,000 species of marine invertebrates, like kind of this size or bigger, right off the coast here in California. There are about 500 reference sequences right now. So obviously most of the species we could never identify because they're not even in the database. So we're spending a lot of our time filling in that database. So we are, as a group, filling in thousands of species of reference barcodes into this database and also working with technologists and working with ourselves to go out into the field to work on this environmental DNA work. So my own work involves a lot of field sampling, a lot of work in the field, a lot of um, working with the specimens uh, in a museum context. That's what we do in museums. We, we work with specimens. And then also I work with the people who are developing that um, environmental DNA approach to be, able, to be able to rapidly, cheaply, and swiftly measure biodiversity on the coastline so that we're able to understand our environment quickly enough to manage it well. So that's the target of our work. That's what that's, I do today. That's super cool. So, okay, so you have, let's say you find a, a shrimp that you know is not in your database. How do you then, do you have to sequence its whole genome or do you have to just take bits and pieces to identify your like identifying chunk of DNA? So it turns out we don't have to sequence its own whole genome. A uh, side project, we're also involved with a huge project that's trying to get a whole genome sequence for every species on the planet. Big job. Big job. Just starting. Yeah. <laughs> but we don't have to do that. Um, okay. The way this barcoding technology, and it's called barcoding, it's genetic barcoding. I'm putting air quotes around it um, because it's by analogy to a barcode of a product in a, in a store. You know, you, you have that little code on the store, you can scan it and, and get the price or get the identify, identify the product. The, there are, there's been a, an effort over the past 10 or 15 years to find particular genes that are Goldilocks genes. So they vary just enough between species that you can tell the difference between species, but they really don't vary at all or very little within a species. So some genes, because of evolution, change very rapidly. So you can't use them to identify things because they're, they're different everywhere for every, everything. Some genes are super conserved. So there's no variation. It's identical in just about every organism on the planet, useless. So if you can find ones that are evolving at just the right rate, you can use them as the indicators. So for most animals, that gene happens to be uh, the CO1 mitochondrial gene, doesn't matter really what it is, but it's, it's a particular gene in the, in the uh, metabolism of, uh, used in, in, from mitochondria, which are organelles and cells um, that have their own genome, which is kind of cool. I mean, we, just to let, just so a little subroutine here, um, we all have our main uh, chromosomes, uh, and by we, I mean humans, for example, have chromosomes that have all our, our DNA on it, except 
we also have mitochondria, which have their own set of DNA. They, separate, they are separate from the rest of our genome. There's a whole lot more mitochondria in us than nuclear gene, genome. So we tend to use mitochondria when we can. It's easier to sequence. So there's a gene that's used for most animals, different couple of genes used for plants. These are pretty short. They're about 650 base pairs long, and those are good enough to do the species ID. So we just have to get a tissue sample and then isolate that, that gene, amplify it, and sequence it to identify an organism. Awesome. Mitochondrial DNA is so weird to think about. Like the, the harder you think about it, the weirder it is. It's so, so cool. cool. Um, but it, that's a little uh, advanced probably for our audience. So um, let's see. So let's see. Hunter wants to know, so when you're going out into the field, like what animals do you see reliably? What animals do you see every once in a while? Uh, what are you seeing out there? So the answer to that question depends a lot on how you look. And I know that sounds really simplistically stupid, but one of the things that's really hard about working in biodiversity in the ocean is that we can't see it. You know, you're on a boat or even if you're diving, you can only see a little bit around you. Um, visibility is hard. So we use a bunch of tools to sample the ocean. Um, we, if we're on a boat, we might put a net out the back. So imagine a net. What are you imagining? A net with holes that are that big maybe, or a net that's a fine mesh. Those two nets will pick up two different groups of organisms. So the big, big hole net, you're gonna get big fish pretty much. Um, the fine mesh net, the big fish will swim away. They're not gonna get caught, but you'll get tiny little crabs and shrimps and little jellyfish and things like that. So that's what you'll see from that catch. Another way we sample the ocean is with grabs. So these are bucket-like things that will you can drop off the, the ship and then close on the seabed and grab a bunch of mud that you can then bring up. In there, you'll generally find worms and other small crustacea. Or if you're diving, you get to see whatever you get to see. Um, we're lousy at seeing small things under the ocean. Um, at least I'm speaking for myself for sure. Um, and so you tend to see big things like lobsters or fish or uh, corals, things like that. Um, what we tend to do as divers to pick up small things, we'll take buckets or things like that and just sweep the rubble or sweep the, the um, algae into the bucket or into a bag, bring that to the surface, put it out on trays and sort through the little stuff there. So what you see depends on where you are and it depends on how you're looking. Right, very cool. Um, the next question is, what's been causing the glowing water lately? So the glowing water, and this is in Southern California right now, um, so this can happen in other parts of the world, but in Southern California, it's, it's playing now. Um, and those are little uh, tiny algae, single-celled algae that are living in the water. There's a whole bunch of species that can do that, um, and they generate um, bioluminescence themselves through a chemical reaction uh, in a way similar to, not identical, but similar to the way fireflies do, for example. And they do it when they get um, hit, basically. So when a wave moves, the wave starts moving through the ocean near the coast, it's jumbling up little cells, so they all start firing off. Um, and so then you see the wave glowing. Or if there's a dolphin swimming through, and I've seen a gorgeous YouTube video, you might search for it, of some dolphins swimming through the bioluminescence and they're just on fire from the luminescence going around them. Um, again, because they're disturbing the water, causing these cells to fire off. Um, those, some, some of the species that are bioluminescent, um, not related to the luminescence, but coincidentally, um, turn out to give off uh, toxic chemicals as well. Um, these chemicals are toxic to humans. Um, they can uh, come out of the water into the air and be respiratory um, irritants and can be toxic uh, to marine mammals and to fish as well. And there are reasons why sometimes we can't eat fish or can't eat shellfish from certain areas. And coincidentally, some of those are bioluminescent. Yeah, those animal, those organisms are so, so cool. Uh, when I was doing field work one time in Belize, I was going out at night because um, I was looking for a nocturnal organism. So I just had my goggles on and I turned my light off and swam through it. And it was, it was so magical. So if you ever had the opportunity to swim through bioluminescent organisms at night, do it. It's uh, pretty magical. Um, let's see. The next and question. you don't need a mask. Yeah, if, if, no, if you don't have a mask, do it anyway. Fine. Yeah, just do it or open your eyes. I mean, if, if, you, if you can handle it. 
Um, it's yeah. really, really cool. Open your eyes and it's, it's like swimming through a lit galaxy. Seriously, yeah, it feels like sci-fi. Um, so here's a question from Sage. What is your favorite marine animal to work with and research? Wow, that is so hard because there are so many good ones. It's, it, that's a simple question and it's really hard to answer. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you of two. One, of course, has got to be octopus because they are like one of the coolest animals on the planet. They are incredibly smart. Their ability to change their color, change their texture is just extraordinary. I don't get the chance to work on them much, but if I were to rerun my professional career, I think I might end up studying octopus. But the other one that I ended up really loving, because I worked on it for a while, was spiny lobsters. Um, ended up working on them in Florida for a while. We were trying to figure out um, what affects their navigational abilities, whether it had to do with smell or um, water currents or actually a magnetic field, Earth's magnetic field. And it turns out it's the magnetic field. But um, we worked with them day after day after day. And I just got to really appreciate the fact that even these little crab-like guys have individual personalities. We'd come to them in their dens each day. And they'd all react to us differently, but each with its own little character. Um, and I got really, really fond of spiny lobsters. They're just sweet little animals, um, which makes it really hard to eat them now, I have to confess. <laughs> the more you work with animals, the less you want to eat them, in, in my personal yeah. experience, yeah. Uh, but that's a, that's a topic for a whole other day. Um, let's see, so uh, what made you want to become a marine biologist when you were young? So I, I grew up in a family that was not particularly science oriented at all. So it wasn't like, you know, my parents did that or I was around them when they were doing science. In the era that I grew up, which was the 19, when I was a, a kid, a uh, little kid, um, was the 1960s. And for anyone who's of that generation, old people like me, um, we will all remember the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau. And I have to confess, it was probably that that sucked me in. Uh, my parents were not, were not scientists, but they recognized my desire to do this and were great about what's the best, shopping me out to, to biologists, um, letting me do, in effect, internships at marine labs and places like that when I was in high school. And that was it. I mean, that was just, it was too cool. I had to just keep doing it. That's awesome. That's awesome you got the opportunity to do that so young. That's really, that's awesome. Um, I, I also watched like a, a National Geographic Kids uh, video. I got it out of the library all the time. And that's how I first got interested in marine science too. So uh, the Jacques Cousteau of the 90s anyway. Um, let's see, so what's the biggest threat to marine life yeah. in your area, Kristen would like to know. So my area is the Los Angeles area, and um, the coastline here um, has a couple of issues. Um, there are a lot of people here. It's, that's the core threat. When you have that many people concentrated in that small an area, it has a huge impact on the coast. Uh, there's an impact from two major causes. Number one, um, which I'll qualify by saying we're getting better and better at this with time, is um, waste and wastewater runoff and um, uh, pollution. Um, what I can tell you is that of course we haven't solved that problem, but oh my God, we're so much better off on that than we were 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 60 years ago. There has been legislation that has cleaned things up tremendously. It's ongoing work. Um, there's always more to be done there, but we are in much better shape now than we used to be. The other thing, of course, is comes under the umbrella of habitat destruction. Um, when you build, and I'm, I'm pointing out my window because I can see it from here, uh, when you build the Port of Los Angeles, you have to destroy what was there before to build a port. What was there before was marshland, and uh, we now have um, completely filled that area, created docks, created a port, created channels. And so that environment is no longer there, um, the environment that used to be there. So that's the other threat. The other threat is uh, changing the environment itself. Um, I should also say fishing um, can be a threat too. Overfishing can be a threat. Fishing is highly regulated. We now have preserves that are turning out to be, and there's very good data for this, really good at acting as nurseries for fish to um, reproduce in well and restock the areas around them. 
Um, so that is working well too, but overfishing can be a problem if it's not appropriately regulated. Absolutely. Um, Jaden would like to know, what was your biggest marine animal that you've ever worked with? Boy, um, the answer to that might be really embarrassing because I tend to focus on small organisms. So to, to take a side story, most diversity is in small organisms. Um, so when you think about the most diverse organisms on, on the planet as a group, that's insects. And they're essentially all small. Um, they've diversified incredibly. Similarly, in the ocean, the highest diversity is in the small critters. They're the tiny things like little isopods, little amphipods, little shrimp, little worms, things like that, that are you know, quarter of an inch long or smaller. So my focus is on small things. Now, big things, probably the, probably the coolest big animal I ever got a chance to interact with, I won't say study. I spent um, a summer working on fishing boats in Alaska. Um, as a United States fishery observer on what at the time were foreign fishing vessels in that water. Um, this was on a Japanese fishing boat and I was acting as a data collecting uh, observer. Um, and we had no common language, none of them spoke English. Cool. Um, and they showed me this about eight or 10 foot long fish that had just come up in their net that they had no idea what it was. I had no idea either. I'm not a fish biologist, but I knew it was weird. Um, I did my best to collect what I could of it. Um, it was this big, long thing. I actually took, a, took its head off because I, I was able to do that, detached it, put it in a plastic bag, did all the standard things you do with fish, took counts of the, of the fin rays on the top to try to identify it later and tried to bring that back with me to the NOAA facility in Seattle, where I was headquartered. Again, by the time I got on the plane in Alaska to come back, uh, the, it was oozing and dripping enough that the plane folks, the airline folks said, no, no, just no. <laughs> so never got the sample, but I eventually figured out it was a thing called an oar fish. And I was um, I was if you ever get the chance, you can Google oar fish. Yeah, I had no clue at the time, totally cool totally neat. Wish I could go back and sample it again, but uh, don't have that chance. Yeah, everybody Google or fish after this session. They're wild looking. They're so cool. If you play Animal Crossing, you may have caught an or fish uh, at some yeah. point during uh, the last couple weeks. Um, all right, the next question is, um, do you ever study ocean plants? We do. Um, so to qualify that, um, you'll notice I'm, I'm, I'm a classic scientist. I have to qualify everything I say. Let me cut to the chase. Yes, we started by working on marine invertebrates, um, but if you're studying biodiversity, it's biodiversity. Um, you get everything. So in particular, since we're working with DNA methods now, we get everything's DNA. When we were doing a, a study in the port recently, uh, of course, we had DNA from the invertebrates we were looking for, but we also picked up DNA from local whales and dolphins and people and cows and pigs and chickens. It's Los Angeles. Of course, there's cow, pig, and chicken DNA down there. Um, but we also pick up DNA from plants. Um, there aren't too many plant plants in the ocean, and I'm saying that in the sense of land plants and vascular plants. Um, there are a few, seagrasses in particular, and seagrasses are a really cool community. They, they produce a really cool, cool community. But we also work um, extensively with algae, um, so which are photosynthesizing like plants. They kind of look like plants. They're totally distantly related. Um, they're, they're not from the same group as plants. They're as far away from plants as we are from, from them. Um, but uh, but they, they play the plant game in the ocean. And uh, so, yeah, we're really interested in the diversity of algae, where they are, where they're coming, where they're going. Um, as water temperature changes, that's a really interesting question to try to get a handle on. Awesome. The next question um, from Ollie is, what's your favorite part of your job? So I think along with many people who are in marine science, the favorite part is the field work. Um, it's getting out in the field, sampling what's out there, getting a chance to get in the water or be at the, at the seashore's edge and be 
doing things that we all love to do, like bending over, turning over rocks, seeing the cool stuff that's living underneath there, putting the rock back, and realizing when I do it, this is my job. You know, I'm, I get paid to play in the ocean, um, which is absolutely amazing. And it comes with great people. Um, and that's one thing that I, I, I really discovered as I was going through college and snuffling around at different potential career paths. Work with the people that you like to work with. Then your job is fun. And there isn't one job that's right. Um, different people have different characters, different disciplines, um, different uh, careers tend to attract different types of personalities. Find the one that meshes well for you. And then you'll always have a good time because you're always working with great people, people who are great for you. And that's been the other real joy of my career is the wonderful people that I get to work with. That's great advice. Um, so Gavin would like to know, when you grab your cup of seawater when you're doing your eDNA samples, how do you get the DNA out of the seawater? Um, it's kind of simple, kind of complicated. Um, the, what we do is we, we sample it. I mean, we could just lean over the deck of a ship with a glass and pick it up. Um, we do it slightly more complicated way because we want to get water from a particular depth. So we put a bottle on a, on a wire and lower that down to the depth and then close the bottle at depth and bring it back up or we go down as a diver and, and open up a bag and, and trap the water there, um, bring it back up. So then we've got the water with everything in it that we want, and then we filter it. And we filter it on filters that are pretty fine mesh, but not so fine that they would actually trap individual molecules of DNA. Turns out what we filter out primarily are cells. So as, as you walk around your house, you know, you're, you're losing skin cells all the time. That's why you have to, to dust, uh, basically. Um, it's, it's the cells, it's the shed cells of animals that we mostly filter out, of animals and plants and algae, um, that we filter out on uh, filters. Then we have a, essentially the concentrate from that water sample on a filter, which we freeze, and then we do a DNA extraction on that filter. And that's a really standard procedure. I mean, if you're uh, in high school, you may have done it in a high school lab um, or a college lab. It's, a, it's really pretty straightforward chemistry to extract the DNA from the cells. And then it moves on into the sequencing procedure. Awesome. Um, have, do you, have you ever studied sharks in your life? I haven't. Um, I've, I've been diving around sharks. I've had really cool, um, non-dangerous, but pretty exciting <laughs> uh, encounters with sharks. Um, but I haven't personally worked on them. There's, uh, if you're in Los Angeles area, there's a researcher here who does, who does beautiful, beautiful work named Chris Lowe. Um, he works at, um, uh, a, at uh, Cal State Long Beach and has a, a great research group that does incredibly cool work on sharks in this area and around the world. So if you're interested in shark research, Chris Lowe, L-O-W-E, I'll give a, 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 a promotion for him. Um, sharks are totally cool animals. Um, an example of an animal that figured out a successful morphology, a successful form and way to live millions and millions of years ago. It's not that they stopped evolving. Like all organisms, they continue to evolve, but they haven't grossly changed through time. That lineage has, has found that that, that, that uh, format works well uh, through a very changing ocean through millions of years. So it's really cool to see an animal group that, uh, landed on that uh, solution really early in evolutionary history that's still around today. Yeah, if it works, it works. Was Chris Lowe exactly. on um, an episode of Ologies? Was he the shark scientist? Probably, I don't know I for sure, but- like yes, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, I, I, I bet, I bet, because he's local here, and so and um, Ali, you know, yeah. who does all these Ologies, is, yeah. is local here, so yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, so where did you go to, uh, for your various degrees? Someone wants to get an, a sense of what schools you went to. Sure. Um, I, uh, uh, well, let's start with high school. Uh, I grew up in New York and uh, in New York State. Um, grew up in it's the suburbs of New York City. And uh, so I went to Ardsley High School, which was a great high school, still is, I presume. Um, from there, I went to Duke University in North Carolina and did my undergraduate uh, degree in zoology there. And then I did, I worked as a, a researcher and a research technician at the University of Washington, but not in school. Then after uh, three years, went to the University of California at Berkeley um, and studied with a researcher named Mimi Cole there and did most of my work though in Washington State at the Friday Harbor Marine Labs um, up in Washington State, which is a fabulous place if you ever get the chance to go there. Um, and did my graduate work there. 
and ended up on a postdoc in South Carolina at University of South Carolina in Columbia. And I was there for nine years or so, continuing research, and then ended up here at uh, the Natural History Museum of LA County. So that was my uh, bouncing around yeah, the country yes. job. That is common in science, bouncing around the country for sure. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So Raphael would like to know, how can people affect the Los Angeles coastline? So people affect it a lot. Um, we affect it by our individual decisions of how to live our lives. Um, one thing that has become very apparent over time, and I, I know that everyone has probably heard this, is the negative impact of plastics um, in the ocean. Um, and we kind of think of that as like, oh, big chunks of plastic that end up washing into the ocean and float around, and that's bad. Turns out actually that's not so much of a big deal. And if there's, if there's a plastic bottle floating around, to a certain extent, doesn't really matter. When it really matters is when you get things like plastic bags that float around, because those are really easy for organisms to eat, and that can be really harmful for them. Um, and when plastic breaks down into tiny, tiny, tiny particles, microscopic sized particles, those, it turns out, chemically can absorb chemicals onto themselves and then get eaten by filter feeders uh, and can be really harmful. So that's a long way of saying one of the ways that um, we can help or harm the environment is by preventing or allowing plastics to wash into the ocean. And here, if you look at the LA River, sometimes you will be able to see plastics floating around in it. We've done a lot lately to try to limit the flow of plastics into the ocean um, by, for instance, passing regulations saying that we now no longer freebie hand out plastic bags in grocery stores. And there's really interesting research that has just come out from an organization called SQUIRP, the, uh, I never remember what it stands for, Southern California Water Research, Southern Ca Coastal, so Coastal Water Research Project for Southern California um, that looked at how much plastic is on the shore before the ban and after the ban of shopping bags. And it worked, is the bottom line. It was an incredibly successful piece of legislation. You never know when you pass those things, is it really gonna work or not? It worked. So that's an example of the way that we can really benefit the coast um, is by promoting legislation that really works to limit our negative impact on the coast and promote legislation that has to do with things like marine sanctuaries and preserve areas that tend to uh, keep places where marine life can live well, reproduce well, and positively affect the marine areas around them. So that's another way we can really positively affect the coast, supporting marine sanctuaries. Very cool. Um, let's see. So, uh, okay, so this is gonna be a hard question to answer simply, but, um, here we go. What are the cell, uh, cells and proteins different or the same between humans and marine mammals or marine animals broadly? So yeah, that, that opens up the whole question in a sense of what is biodiversity is, right. is one way of approaching that. So I'll take it from an evolutionary standpoint. So you are really, really, really similar to your parents because you're their offspring. So their genetic material is combined and that makes you. The same is true for their parents, your grandparents, and on up the chain. But the further away you go, the further back you go, um, since the past, there has been this continual divergence of similarity because of mutations. So the further back in time you go, the less similar the organisms are that diverged at that time. So you are less similar to your cousins than you are to your, your brother and sister. Thinking back long, long time ago, marine mammals didn't diverge from us all that long ago in evolutionary time. They came from um, pig-like animals. Um, some, oh, and now because I'm not a paleontologist, uh, don't quote me on this, but some tens of millions of years ago. Um, which is not that long in, in geological time. So we're a bit different. The pig-like animals that were reproducing then, and then there's a strain that became the marine mammals and a strain that became, for instance, today's pigs, um, are fairly similar still. Obviously, marine mammals look a lot different. They've got some modifications that, that uh, evolution was sele selected for in evolution, like uh, flippers and migration of their nostrils to the top of their heads, so they have a blowhole. 
things like that. And that happens slowly through selection through time. But once again, they're pretty similar. Now, organisms that devolved, that, that diverged on from each other long, long ago in the past, hundreds of millions of years ago, like when we diverged from the mollusks, from the snails and, and, and bivalves and things like that. Well, there's been a lot of time for mutation and change to happen in both of those lineages through time. And it just keeps going. It just, evolution never stops as, as animals keep reproducing, unless the lineage goes extinct, then it stops. Um, but as long as the, the, the lineage is still there, it keeps going. So those changes accumulate through time, meaning that if you were to take the whole string of DNA of me and look at all of the, the, the particular base sequences on that string and compare it to a pig, there are some differences, maybe a percent, 1% or so might be different. If you compare my string of DNA, my whole DNA to a clam, it's gonna be maybe 50% different. Um, huge numbers of differences have accumulated. Um, and it's a matter of evolutionary time. How many differences have accumulated on the DNA strand? So that's the, I won't say short, but I won't say long, the kind of medium length answer on how similar we are or why we are more or less similar to some organisms. It depends on when the lineages, how long ago in time the lineages diverged. diverged. Awesome, perfect. Um, all right, next question. Hannah would like to know, um, populations of species can vary depending on location. So you have these barcodes of uh, ID for each species. Does the barcode that you might use on the West Coast in LA work, let's say, in the Gulf of Maine around Boston for the same species? Hannah, I think we need to hire you in our lab. Um, you have cut right to the core of one of the core questions that we are trying to answer and that we work on a lot. So we tend, historically, <clears throat> We call a thing what we call it because of what it looks like, basically. It's morphology, it's shape, it's form, it's color, the spiky bits, the non-spiky bits, whatever, whatever the organism is. So that's how we name a species is because those things are different in this population from another population. If they're different enough, we say, ah, those are two different species. Um, we can also argue you can uh, try to see if the populations can reproduce, if they are, are unable to reproduce, very good evidence they're separate species, things like that. So when we're working, for example, just on our shore, um, we have specimens of organisms from different places that we call the same thing. They, uh, the way we phrase it is they key out the same. In other words, when you're going through a dichotomous key to try to identify something, you end up at the same species because they really are indistinguishable. You look at, you look at the two specimens and they're, they're the, you can't find any difference between them. Sure, good. Say we do that from a specimen from Washington State and from here. When we look at the genetics, sometimes we discover they are different. And so that's cropping up a lot in the work we do. So things that we call the same thing because they look the same in different places are turning out to be different species all the time. So that's one thing that's really interesting in the work we're doing is we are discovering what are called these cryptic species a lot. Species that look the same, but turns out are reproductively completely isolated. Um, and, and don't interact reproductively at all and really are separate species. That's also a problem for us because the way this environmental DNA works is we get the barcode sequence from an organism. We then look it up in the database of sequences that have been registered in the database with a known specimen of a known species, take that sequence, put it in the database. Let's say we pick up a crab here, take its tissue sample, um, get the barcode sequence and look it up in the database. The closest match, not identical, but really, really close, may come up to be a crab in Brazil. We have to take a step back and say, ah, have we just found a Brazilian crab here? Is the crab species here really identical to the crab in Brazil? Or is it just that that's the crab in the database that happens to be the most closely related to the one that we're looking at here because we don't have the sequence for that species in the database. We're running into that a lot too. So that's another challenge we're facing. So that question is really important to us. What is, the, what is the sequence that really represents a species and what is the species that really goes with the sequence? And those are hard, challenging, difficult questions that we wrestle with a lot. Cool, sounds complicated. I'm glad 
it's your job and not my job. That sounds really cool. Um, the next question from Raphael, could you recommend a book about evolution? Ebook about evolution. Wow. So maybe many your, good ones. your top five, maybe. <laughs> sure. Um, your Inner Fish is the one that I would recommend. It is a wonderful story about fish evolution. And of course, we are fish. Um, we are bony fish, uh, it turns out, um, if you trace us back. And it's a beautiful story that is tells about evolution, tells about how we learn about evolution and the interaction between paleontology in the study of evolution and morphology and understanding how organisms are, where they come from, how we study them, and why it's really cool to go in the field and study them. So that's a really nice book. I'd recommend that one. Sounds good. Yeah, I've, I've heard that really great things about that book too. So that sounds good. Okay, so we try to and keep Neil these... Uh, Neil Shubin, is that who wrote that book or a different Neil? Neil Shubin. Yeah. Neil Shubin Great. is the author. Wonderful. Um, so we try to keep these sessions to about 45 minutes and we've already been talking about marine science for 42 minutes. So um, we try, I know, but me too. We try to uh, ask the same two questions of everybody at the end. And so the first question mm -hmm. is, what is something that you wish everyone in the world knew um, about your area of expertise? And then the second question is, what is something that you wish everybody in the world knew about literally anything? It can be as silly or significant as you'd like. Brutal, brutal questions. Okay, to answer the first one, I'm gonna take two seconds, give me just one second, I'll be right back. Okay. So about my field, one of the questions was asked earlier, I alluded to this. I would love it for people to understand how much fun field work is. And if you want a quick introduction to that, I would recommend read this book, The Sea of Cortez by Steinbeck and Ricketts. Um, it's a glorious book that talks about a field trip to the Sea of Cortez in the 20th century and conveys the mood and reason why we love field work better than anything else I've ever written. So that that's something good. about my field. Great. Um, now, everything in general. Um, what I wish is for, and I know I'm speaking to the choir here, but for people to remember that the only real challenge to science you don't like is more and better science. That sounds good. All right. That's well, it. thank you. Thank My you message so for the day. much. That sounds like a solid message. And it also um, fits neatly on a pillow, which is also great advice when you can get it out really quickly. That's very important. All right. So thank you so much for taking the time. Erin, thank you so much for signing. Uh, we always appreciate you being here with us. Um, and everybody else, thanks for coming. So we uh, have mountains on Friday at 1 Eastern. We've got uh, elephants on Tuesday. Let me double check that that's actually happening Tuesday. Tuesday. And that's going to be at noon Eastern, not 1. And then next Friday, we've got bugs with Glenn Pearson at 1 p.m. Eastern on the 29th. Um, you can always support our program at Skype or uh, uh, paypal.me slash Skype the Scientist or patreon.com slash Skype a Scientist, and you can keep up to date on what we have going on at skypeascientist.com under the live streams tab. Um, if you have any suggestions of what you'd like to see in the future, feel free to email skypeascientist at gmail.com, and we look forward to seeing you all uh, on Friday. Uh, and thank you again to Dean and Aaron uh, for being with us today. And thank Hi. you all. Oh, Dean, is there anywhere that we can find yes. you on the internet? Uh, so if we have more questions, we can find you? or anything else you want to plug? Sure. Um, we have a very outdated website that needs work on at research.nhm.org. So that's research.nhm for natural history museum.org. And you can find information about us there. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye everyone. All right.